Well, it's been working on it as long as oh. I have. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, hi, I'm David Getz. I'm a Cloud Files developer. I've been working on Swift uh, for four or five years. It's kind of hard to remember. And um, this here is Michael Barton. Hi, Michael Barton. I'm a principal engineer at Rackspace. I've been working on Swift for almost six and a half years. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, so we're going to be doing a talk called uh, OMG Objects, the Unscaling Underbelly of OpenStack Swift. Um, basically going to be like some of the um, problems we've had with Swift over the years um, and go through some of the solutions. Uh, basically, I'm going to go through and complain a whole lot about stuff that happens because I get all mad about that. And then Barton's going to come through and with some solutions, which is what he does. So <laughs> it's kind of like a, one of our team meetings here. Okay, so starting off, first, uh, we're not trashing Swift. Just want to get that out of the way. Uh, Skipped OpenStack Swift does scale very well. Uh, so Cloud Files is the first Swift cluster that was developed at Rackspace a long, long time ago. And um, we think that a public big cloud is a primary use case for it, but we're probably not the most common use case for it, um, at least from what I've seen at the conferences and stuff. Um, you know, and Swift can do many, many, many things. This is just one of them. Uh, so at Rackspace, we have six clusters uh, on four different continents. Um, our daily peaks are around 20,000 requests a second. We have over 120 petabytes of capacity, over 75 billion objects, 50,000 accounts, which is important. And uh, we all run that with less than uh, 10 ops and admins. So we got a whole lot of stuff. And um, what I want to focus on is the accounts. Uh, what makes Rackspace or Cloud Files tricky is the different kinds of uh, clients that we have. Uh, some people look at us as just a, uh, kind of like a cold, warm storage type thing where they try to, um, you know, they just do lots of puts and those objects just kind of sit there and mind their own business and, um, for a long period of time. And, uh, other clients, because we also run a really big CDN out of our um, cluster, they, you know, they'll do smaller objects or they want uh, lots of range requests for videos and they expect really fast um, performance. And this makes it difficult because you kind of have to uh, solve for the, gener for the general case. And just as an example, uh, there's one of our clusters where over the years was just, it never really had problems. It was kind of like our golden boy type cluster. And the reason why is because we had an internal customer uh, that used us uh, as a backend for um, like email and stuff like that. And it was kind of like that cold, warm storage. So they're a multi-petabyte cluster, and it just kind of spread out the load on all the nodes. And all the other uh, customers just kind of reap the benefits of having like a whole lot of object storage, uh, object nodes serving less hot objects with lots of traffic. I'm still worried you picked a picture of Amazon to put on there. I don't think it is Amazon. It's no. Not all warehouses are Amazon. <laughs> Pretty close. Yet, yeah. OK, so here's a very quick introduction to Swift. Um, basically, there's this proxy server layer, and we're not going to talk about that one at all. Um, and then there's three um, internal services underneath there. There's the account, the container, and the object layer. Uh, so basically a client does a request into the proxy server and depending on the type of request, it'll just send that down to one of those services. Like if it's a DB listing of your containers, DB listing of the objects, or an object um, put or delete or whatever which goes directly to the object server. And we're going to deal with scaling issues with each one of these services. Except for the account layer. Uh, I just put this because I thought it was kind of funny. We love you, account layer. Uh, it never goes down. It works great. Uh, I can't think of a single scaling issue we've ever had with our account layer. Uh, and there's a reason for that is because at Cloud Files, we limit the number of containers a single customer can ha we have to 500,000, which kinds of, um, you know, we just limit it until because, and that's why we don't have any problems there. So the object container listings, uh, on the other hand, uh, we do have problems with. These, just as a background, the container layer is what holds all the listings of an object. When you put an object into Swift, then you can, do a, you can hit that object directly. But if you do an object listing, it goes to container databases. 
and uh, get served out of there. Um, every single container in Swift is a separate independent SQLite database that's sitting out on some server someplace. So the proxy server gets the request, it sends it over there, loads up the SQLite database, uh, spits out the result, and that's kind of how it works. Uh, the good thing about this is there's no centralized database for all the objects in your cluster, so it's horizontally scalable, and I put ish, uh, because within one container, it is not horizontally scalable. Uh, and the problem with this is that containers can get very, 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 very big, especially for a SQLite database. Uh, we have containers in the wild, out in our clusters, that are hundreds of gigabytes in size with over a billion objects in them. Uh, so you could see that, you could look at this one direction and say, wow, Swift scales to that many objects per container. But the problem is, is uh, that we don't have any way of stopping these things from growing. Um, the good news is they still perform relatively well. We don't get complaints from these customers. I guess they're used to the eventual consistency model. But uh, in many cases, we have contacted customers saying, hey, can you shard up your containers? And then some of them go back and say, hmm, no. <laughs> uh, it's public cloud, you know, we'll just, this is what we're doing. So, um, yeah, so this is still a really big problem for us. Uh, the ways we try to address it are with sort of non-technical solutions working with customers on their architecture. Also with sort of medium technical solutions like rate limiting rights per second. Uh, we try gluing together ever bigger SSD rates to try and keep ahead of the problem. Uh, we figure eventually we will need container sharding. There's another racker named Matt Oliver who's uh, working on that. Uh, he's not working with us, but he, uh, we're hoping that someday he'll save us from uh, <laughs> yeah. so everybody certain the doom. So uh, that the uh, feature where this is presented, the biggest problem that I can think of at Rackspace was with the expiring objects feature, which is the feature I love to hate. Uh, because it's a neat feature, uh, some customers really like it. Uh, like we have customers that like um, send us up video game screencasts and then they'll save them for a couple months and then it'll be auto-deleted and uh, stuff like that. Um, basically the feature is, is you put an object into Swift and you can set a metadata header that says delete this, adder, this object automatically after so much time. The problem with this is, is the way it was implemented is very, very, very container level, uh, container layer heavy. Uh, it just coincided that the time when we got SSDs at Rackspace uh, is we came up with this feature and um, I think we just kind of got giddy with how fast they were compared to the spinning disks that uh, we just, just thought that the container layer now that are on SSDs is not going to run out, which it did. So um, here's a, just a quick introduction into what happens with a non-expiring object put. Basically the proxy server sends the put with the object down to the object server. It saves the object and then it tries to send a request up to the container database. And if that container database is unresponsive, it'll save an async for later on. And we have this background daemon that will go around and send those up at a later point in time. And it's super cool. It's part of our eventually consistent framework. And um, we can, you know, the customer can just keep on putting objects and the container server can go down for a short period of time and they'll never know the difference. But this is what it looks like for expiring objects. And I think I missed a couple arrows, but uh, basically, there's a whole second async that can be created for the, kind of, for the expiring objects marker. And then we have this daemon that runs in the background that's constantly hammering the, the expiring objects container and, uh, and then trying to find objects to delete. And then when it does delete them, well, that turns into an expiring objects delete down the road. So it kind of like triples or quadruples the load on the general container layer. And on a single container layer, you get something like this. This, is, uh, this graph is in number of asyncs in the millions. This is 1.2 billion asyncs that we had put into our cluster uh, one time uh, a while back. And what happened was, is we had this customer start putting in a whole bunch of objects and they sharded out the containers so they can get multi-hundred writes per second. And every single one of those had uh, X delete after header on it. So those went up to the container databases up here and everything was kind of going along happily. Uh, for that whole time, we, uh, you know, it worked just fine. But then they started in September, say, 2012. Then September 2013, all those objects started deleting. So then we had this container daemon going and finding all these objects and then sending deletes into that same container layer. So 
Overnight, this container layer, which is handling hundreds of requests a second, is now going to do, ha having to handle twice that with the daemon. And it just stopped working. <laughs> and uh, it was doing many of these a second, and they piled up quick, and we got over a billion asyncs, uh, which is just not good. So, me and Barton and crew. Uh, well, this really still isn't fixed either. Uh, <laughs> we're still behind on asyncs, uh, not on asyncs, on expiring objects. Uh, we don't have asyncs piled up quite like that, but we, do, it, we still are way behind. Uh, we've put in a few fixes to Swift to try and improve uh, DB throughput. We've upgraded SQLite. Most of these are performance problems, not really uh, tackling the architecture of the problem. Uh, so yeah, we, we, we've still tried kicking the can down the road on this problem, uh, chasing after performance. Uh, we really need to re-architect the whole thing to decentralize it. Uh, there's a spec out there by Alan Irwin right now, and we're hoping that he'll save us uh, <laughs> yeah. on this particular problem. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the object layer, which is the bread and butter of Swift. Uh, it's the simplest part of Swift. Uh, it's basically, it just sits on top of the object servers and reads and writes bytes. Uh, it hasn't changed a whole lot. It's been shuffled around a little bit, but you know, the API hasn't changed much. It hasn't changed much in the last six years. And it has had the same general problem for six years, which gets worse as your scale increases. And that is inconsistent performance. This is a graph of one of our big internal customers sending in puts into our system, and this is the response time on those puts. Now, the majority of those puts, they're all the same object coming from the same endpoint, uh, coming into the same container, I think. Uh, yeah, it's same container, because it's SLO segments. And the, the line at the bottom, which is 99% oh, of the puts, the request time's hanging around 12 seconds, 10 to 12 seconds. But then about less than 1% of the time, it'll go to some bad node out in the cluster, and they're getting plus 4,000 second response times. Same object, basically. 12 seconds, 4,000 seconds. Uh, so, you know, you could say to yourself, well, um, you know, it's a cloud solution, and it is, and all that. But uh, this customer, they're putting segments of an SLO, and some of those SLOs might have 1,000 segments in them. So from their point of view, they're putting 1,000, but from their point of view, they're just putting one object. Well, if less than 1% of those fails, then for that one object, they're getting, it's not less than 1% failure rate, it's more around 30 something. So this client was seeing around 30 something percent uh, failure on their puts um, because of this inconsistent problem. So yeah, the object server is tied closely to the hardware. It has to be, it's basically the lowest level you get in Swift. Um, and drives do fail, especially when you have tens of thousands of them, which we do. And uh, the file system can freeze up and this stuff happens on any system. But what we found is that the Python object server becomes unresponsive too easily. And that the only way that we've been able to fix this over the years was to have really great monitoring, which we do, and really great ops, which we do. And, but they're still just people and they gotta go out there and fix these things. And that's the only kind of buffer that we got right now. Until, dun dun dun. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I paid somebody $5 to draw that hummingbird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked him to make it look like he, he could be friends with the uh, Go Gopher, uh, so that's what I got to. <laughs> uh, so a couple of years ago, my friend Florian asked me to go to GopherCon with him. Uh, I decided if I was going to GopherCon, I probably should have written something in Go. Uh, so I decided to re-implement the Swift object server because I thought I understood it pretty well and uh, I thought it could be improved on. And uh, yeah, what I ended up with was something, by the time I got to GopherCon, it was really benchmarkable and I was really impressed with the performance. So uh, I kind of spent my spare time over the next year or so uh, getting it to where it uh, could be dropped in for the Swift object server. Uh, and what we found was that it was like super fast. It's two times as fast for most operations. It uses about 75% less CPU. Uh, it's also a lot tougher because Go, yeah. 
That was, I, I drew the body for this one. Uh, Just keep on the software development. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Swift has a huge problem where, you know, disk I.O. can block other requests going on. Uh, we all know about that problem. It's been a problem since the beginning. Uh, Go uses real OS threads, threads for the disk I.O., so, uh, you know, you get isolation between requests. Uh, bad drives don't lock up the, Swift, the, uh, the object server the way they do in Swift at all. Uh, we also implemented a really simple kind of error handling where it's basically a, 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 a semaphore per drive that limits the number of requests that can go to them. Uh, and that really cuts down on uh, the number of timeouts we get from the proxy to the object server. This is a graph of uh, one of our production clusters. That's the number of timeouts per hour. And you can see, we, hopefully you can tell when we switch from Swift to Hummingbird, the, the number of timeouts dropped to basically zero. Uh, this is another up, uh, switch we did. This is just one server that was where the, the Swift object server had basically become completely unresponsive, all because of one drive. Uh, so when we switched it, you can see the number of timeouts to that server dropped to basically nothing, and the number of requests it was serving went from basically nothing to uh, a bunch. Is that per hour? Yeah, per hour. Per hour. Uh, so Hummingbird has helped a lot with the object server, but uh, we, we still have another problem. Yeah, which is replication. So, um, so replication is uh, what does everything. Uh, you know, if you have a, uh, a node go down and because a hard drive fails, well, then you switch out that, you get new gear in there, and then the replicator will go find some other copy of the object and put it over here. So it's kind of the magic behind Swift. Um, and it's extremely important, but uh, it has the same problems as the object server. It's written in Python back with, uh, with rsync to move the data around. This is the rsync version of the replicator, which I'm talking about here. Uh, but it can get slow, very slow. Uh, this is a log taken from one of our production nodes that had some slow drives on it and it wasn't doing very well. It probably needed to be switched out. But this is just a log line where this replicator was saying that it would not finish a pass on that object node for 32 days. And uh, that's just not good. Uh, so here's a couple examples of how that's not good. Uh, this is um, something, this is a healthy uh, change. So somebody puts an object and it's out there on its three primaries and it's perfectly fine. This is, the box represents the primary nodes. So that three, no, that object is sitting on its three primary nodes. And then you do a ring change because you got some new capacity, uh, you, you're getting a lot of customers, you add a new ring change. So that new, uh, say that new server is going to be number four. And this object is going to be, should be moved to that new server so it can fill up and the server that it was on can drain and so you have your balance again. So uh, three is sitting out there where it was, but your replicator finishes the pass, it moves three back to four and then it deletes the one from three and everybody's happy again, you have three copies of your object, you're filling up your new node, rejoice. Well, with slow replication, uh, the same thing happens. Step one, same. Step two, same. But um, say that one or two uh, replicate to number four, and three is still sitting there because it happened to be on that 32-day guy. Well, during this point in time, you have four copies of your object sitting out there. So we call this over-replication. And this is a temporary problem. It happens all the time, and it's just a thing. But uh, in some of our clusters, we're adding capacity and adding capacity and adding capacity, and this over-replication step just kind of lingers. And uh, when you're, some of your servers are at capacity, which is why you're adding new capacity, replication slows down, and things just get kind of worse. And basically, these new nodes don't fill up quick enough, and your at-capacity nodes don't drain quick enough. Now, let's make this worse, because it's fun. Uh, <laughs> You have your first object, this is the good side, you have your first object, uh, you do a ring change, you're back to your one, two, four idea, but then they send a delete to the object. So that delete only gets sent to the primary nodes. Number three doesn't know about the delete because it's not supposed to be there, it's a transitionary state. Um, but replication on three worked this time. So it, it sends, it's gonna do its put back to one, two, or four, and then it finds out that there's a tombstone there that this object should be deleted. So it's like, oh, fine. So he just deletes himself, rejoice. Well, 
what happens if uh, the object's sitting out there, the delete happens, and a lot of time passes before your replication uh, window completes? Well, what happens is, is that the tombstone sitting on one, two, and four eventually gets reclaimed. Uh, be, we just, we clean those things up after a certain amount of time. Three's still sitting out there. He knows nothing about anything. He's sitting out there all by himself. Then finally, sometime later, three happens. And he goes out and talks to one, two, and four and says, hey, do y'all have me? And they're like, I've never heard of you. And they're like, oh, okay, here I am. So he copies out to one, two, and four, a brand new copy of himself, thinking, oh, I only have one copy left of me. And now I'm triple replicated. I'm so happy. Well, the thing is, is that one, two, and four shouldn't be there anymore. They're gone. The customer's not paying you for them anymore. And uh, it's not in the container listing, but there's the object is, it's unaccounted for, it's taking up space, and this is where everybody screams, like Luke Skywalker, especially me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, all this boils down to is that replication needs to go fast, and it needs to be super easy to watch and to find problems and everything else. So. Um, after we had so much success with the object server, kind of our two, uh, long standing goal the whole time was to switch over to replication. And here's what Hummingbird could do with replication. Uh, so, one thing was that we got kind of changed the model of replication. Uh, with Swift, we only ever push data from one server to another. And uh, it, it turns out that if you, if you just send back a little bit of data, you can help a lot. For example, if you're trying to sync an old data file to a server and it turns out there's a newer tombstone over there. Uh, you could just send back, hey, we have a newer file, and then the sending server can know to remove that data file because it's outdated, doesn't need it anymore. Uh, that, that, that really helped us a lot get rid of handoffs. Uh, you can see here where we rolled the Hummingbird replicator to each of these object servers. Uh, these are, these all object servers all had a lot of data they needed to get off uh, the server. No, this is a graph of capacity on the, oh, yeah. on the node that, we're trying to drain. That, that's a graph of amount of free space on the server. And all these servers needed to drain data. And you can see where we rolled Hummingbird to them. They were able to, you know, turn around, uh, go from basically having flat uh, available data to actually getting data off the servers. Yeah, we, we added new nodes, but we couldn't fill them up. And the existing nodes that were at capacity were not draining right. until we released Hummingbird. Uh, another change we made. For some reasons, well, because of rsync again, Swift will, uh, if, it's multi if it's replicating a partition to multiple peers, it'll walk the file system three times, it'll read files three times, or up to three times, and send those to uh, the peers. Uh, with Hummingbird Replicator, we actually walk the file system once and replicate to any peers that need the files as we go. Uh, the Hummingbird replicator also gets the same speed ups as the object server, where we're using, you know, 75% less CPU. Uh, we get isolation between uh, the various threads of execution because each drive gets its own Go routine. Um, today, three of our six clusters are running Hummingbird. Uh, it's made a big difference in those clusters. Yeah, for example, the customer that I had, the one with the 4,000 seconds, uh, yeah, they're, where in some of our normal clusters they're getting 65% uh, success rate in the cluster where we deployed Hummingbird, it's above 99% success rate. Uh, so with Hummingbird in the future, we're going to continue to work on replication. It's not really done, but it's at a point that we're obviously deploying it and it's working. Uh, we'd eventually like to replace Hash's Pickle. We've wanted to do that for a long time, and we think this is kind of a platform where we can play around with that a little bit better. Uh, we haven't ever done replicated policies just because we don't use them, but it would probably be pretty easy to go and add those back in. Uh, we have a, a prototype for the proc for replacing the proxy. Uh, we don't think, like, actually replacing the proxy would probably be a Herculean task that we're not getting prepared to take on. But the, the speed up we get from the prototype is so much that we're kind of interested in maybe see if we can get a reduced set of the functionality working so that we could support maybe like Glance or uh, our CDN product, those sort of things on sort of a simplified proxy. That would take a lot of traffic off of our Swift proxies that use really a lot of resources. Uh, that's pretty much where we want to go with Hummingbird. Yep. So. We got some time left over for questions. Uh, yes, 
or there's a mic. Um, I don't know if I can, yeah. So uh, Ashish Nadkarni, um, IDC, um, had a question on, so there's been a lot of talk about erasure coding in Swift, and you didn't mention anything about it. Is it something you're neglecting completely in your future direction, or is something you'd consider? Um, we haven't really looked at it too much. Yeah, uh, basically what happened was, is Mike started on this prototype, and um, he kind of talked about it, and it's kind of like a running joke around the office that, haha, yeah, we're going to move to Golang. And uh, so it kept on going there, and our problems didn't go away. And um, eventually, we, after several months, we kind of switched over to fix it to get it working. And our small team of developers went and tried to implement everything that Rackspace uses, and that's as far as we've gotten. Um, so, yeah, we're just we've just we have just thus far done what Cloud Files does. Clay has a whole notebook full, <laughs> and, and he's like on page 93. <laughs> it was like four pages. Don't be jerks. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so you guys talked about some stuff. You talked about the hash pickle, some other things you want to do in the replicator, but yep. I think the object server maybe, um, I mean, I, and I guess you kind of got to this with the EC stuff, but I mean, aside from other, some of those other compatibility stuff, are you guys, is that layer done, the API? Or are you feeling, you okay. know, I mean, you've okay. obviously replaced it in three clusters, so. How, how close is that, you think? Uh, it fulfills our needs pretty well. I don't... Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's a drop-in replacement. Uh, one thing I've, is that uh, we deployed it in our first cluster over a period of, I think, four months. And uh, we, you can go in and you can just install Hummingbird and you can just run it. You can actually run it out of your existing Swift object server config, I think it still works. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have a separate one for Hummingbird, but uh, you can do that. And you can just turn on Hummingbird and let it run for a day and watch all your problems just magically go away. And then you can turn it off and go back to the other one. And, um, if you're a masochist. Yeah, <laughs> just for kicks, you know. And we did that. You know, we, we installed it and we made sure everything was going. But it, it, Hummingbird does implement a new replication model, but it supports the old one. So you can, you can run your Hummingbird object server and the Python object replicator can talk to it, yeah. right? But uh, so you can just deploy it on one node and all the other Python daemons can talk to it. But if you want to run the Hummingbird replicator daemons, you have to deploy the entire cluster uh, with Hummingbird nodes because a replicator daemon can only talk to a Hummingbird object server. No. Uh, so, yeah. Um, have you guys had a little like, follow up on some of those, the slow requests? So on a, a, you had an object server that you're giving an example, you had 90 drives and one of them was bad. And, and the, the impact on, at the, in the, the the Python processes, whenever you're sharing everybody in the same event loop, uh, you know, if you've got right there, you're trying to do non-blocking I.O. and you just insert a bunch of blocking I.O. Uh, and, you know, everybody craps out. It's so unfair. Uh, and, of course, with Go, you've got the threads, much better. But, I mean, those drives are still slow. They, they, they still got to be slow. Um, do, do you still see, you know, you said 99% success rate on that, that, that one customer. So what, what is the impact on the bad requests going into the, the Go object server? So uh, I'll share two examples. The first one was the one we put the drive on. And this was kind of like a perfect use case for Hummingbird as opposed to Swift. Uh, one of our ops guy was, uh, he just, there was no one responsive. And we're like, well, let's just try it. So we put it on, we got it running. And uh, you can hit a disk usage URL, which will show you the error limited, which is, I love that thing. But anyway, there was just one not node. There was just one drive out of 90 on that server that Hummingbird had to error limit. All the rest of those drives are perfectly running fine, and that's why there's such a huge, you know, good thing happening. Well, in one of our other clusters, uh, it was badly performing, and we tried to put out Hummingbird out on there, and it's exactly what you said. Um, there was some nodes where, um, so first off, I mean, the read timeouts did go down, but it didn't like solve everything wildly, because there were some nodes out there, they were just messed up. And there was like a whole bunch of drives on, on several nodes that were bad. So the, you look at one server and the disk usage, there'll be like four or five or six or eight drives that are all bouncing around all over the place. And Hummingbird, while it did slightly improve the situation, didn't solve that problem. Because it can't. Because you're sitting on top of hardware. Yeah, but, but, but there wasn't any like unintended like secondary consequences of like threads being leaked or the Go routines aren't getting closed down correctly or you know, some sort of like CPU spike or something. I mean, no, no, it, really. it was bad uh, for the request, but the, the Go core was yeah. handling it. The, the load goes through the roof, um, but not any worse than Python. Uh, 
Well, since we're error limiting, it doesn't really do that anymore. Oh, that's true too. Uh, also, we're kind of conscious of the fact that we could basically shut down a drive without knowing about it. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to avoid that. If we just start rejecting all requests to a slow drive, I mean, we could basically shut it out without purposely removing it from the ring or knowing to, we need to do maintenance or any of that stuff. So we're trying to figure out exactly how to monitor yeah. uh, some of the error limiting that we've put in. Yeah, that was the one kind of fear the whole way through is that we could, end the, we could start getting these like silent bad guys out there. And so yeah, we're, we're, we're working on separate new types of monitoring. Like there's a swift drive audit and all that. Yeah. Um, but we're working on with our ops guy really closely uh, getting next generation of that. Can I switch to some questions? Yeah, about there's somebody in the back. <laughs> yeah, just, you know. Thank you. Uh, uh, I work a lot with service providers, and uh, I guess what you said worries me a little bit because it seems that if, uh, you know, if I was to advise them to, uh, from an object store to build uh, it on Swift, uh, that if they don't have the sort of capabilities that Rackspace has obviously built up over a period of time, uh, that if they are going to extend beyond a fairly simplistic on-premise Swift object store, they're going to run into a lot of problems and, and basically have got an awful lot of learning to reach the sort of expertise that you have. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like, uh, we got to over 100 petabytes capacity, six clusters, four nodes, and all that stuff. That, we got to that on Python. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't imagine that there's some software out there that at that scale doesn't have any problems. Uh, it's just that this, and, and the other thing is, is we have 50,000 customers, uh, and we always hear about from the bad ones, right? But whenever our product guy goes out and talks to our customers, even our big customers, he'll go and he'll like send emails out to our top 10 customers. They're all happy with us. Uh, you know, like, it does work really well. Um, and, uh, but... but I, um, think, I think you are, to do anything non-trivial, you are, you are trivial, you are gonna have to be something of an expert. It's not the easiest system in the world to run. Yeah. I think anyone who runs it would agree with that. Yeah, but I mean, I would just say that, yeah, I mean, we have hundreds of nodes, 270 terabytes of capacity per node, tens of thousands of hard drives. I couldn't imagine, I mean, it's just, a, it's, that's a complicated problem. Okay, so, so basically you're saying you can do it, but it's going to be complicated and, and they need to go in with eyes open. And perhaps if we just follow that up, if with all the replication issues, if you start to distribute things as lots of service providers want to, so you have maybe two copies on prem, one 500 kilometers away, again, it seems with this, I mean, I know about the eventually consistent, but I kind of get the impression that, you know, if you've got four, six, 16 terabyte drives, whatever it's going to be, you're never ever, if one goes bang, you know, let's face it, you're never ever going to get to the stage of them ever be consistent ever again. Well, so that slide I put up with the bad airline, that was the worst one I could find when I was doing this. Um, and that's actually a cluster that um, was fairly small and uh, for several reasons uh, just got a ton of traffic. Um, our bigger clusters that are more spread out, there's less partitions per drive, there's more object nodes talking to each other, the replication times don't look anything like that. Um, but but over, over long distance though? So let's say there's 500 miles? We don't do anything over long distance. Uh, and so I have no experience so yeah, talking talk to that. Else Everything's that. within a cluster. So long distance you'd think is a bad idea? I don't have any experience with it. And I've heard other people talking about um, Swift clusters that do it and they're perfectly successful. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I say, but there's probably a reason why nobody ever talks about the object layer and the object replicator. It's because it works almost all the time. But, um, you know, we have a very big cluster. Some of our nodes are sitting out there for a long period of time. And uh, basically, you know, I mean, it's like, it's kind of like the, uh, the billion objects per container problem. I mean, how many people have that problem? But we're just happen to be one of them. Any other questions? Clay? 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 Clay, Clay can fill, <laughs> just fill the rest of our time with questions. Oh, okay. okay yeah, so I wanted to switch to replication. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so that was really interesting. So, um, what do you, do you, do you know off the top of your head, like, what is your current reclaim age? Are you still running the default of a week or? 
We are running the default of a week. I would okay. like to increase. So it seems like, time. yeah, <laughs> just make replication ah. happen in a week. Yeah, what are you, that's the best slide. Perfect. Could, yes. Yeah. Everybody's happy. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you get some sort of warning? Is your, I mean, are you, are you monitoring your replication cycle times? Are you able to see, like, does that just happen like immediately? You, you just suddenly replication cycle times a month. Uh, whereas it had been running it, you know, three days, and then the, when you did the last capacity adjustment, it, it took, you know, five days to push out that. Yeah, no, it does not happen immediately. And in, in, in our bigger clusters, that was in one of our medium-sized kind of heavy traffic, not that big yet, clusters. It's kind of like this adolescent phase that seems to kind of happen. Um, but, uh, and it was at, like, it was at capacity. It was yeah. like things were going wrong in that cluster for reals. <laughs> And uh, so that's when I, that's the one I looked at for this thing. Yeah. And most of our clusters, um, yeah, you can find that stuff. And you can also check your jobs.log and look at those things and you can find the drives that are going slow and then you can use that. Your ops can go say, oh, let's go find that drive. But um, so like these are all problems. I don't know if they're all problems, but to a large degree, you know, they can be solved with the uh, fixing bad hardware, better monitoring, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. um, but we are just trying to, and you're always going to have to do that no matter what, but we're just going to, you know, we're just trying to get around that. And like I say, the getting rid of the hashes pickle idea um, was always, uh, that could actually increase um, speed on puts a lot and not having to have this file system, and we we're kind of wanting to do that if we could prove that Hummingbird, that we can get rid of our sync. And, um, and, uh, and yeah. Cool. Are, are you guys still working on that? Is Barton making any progress? Um, yes. No, still, not this yeah. week. <laughs> yeah, we're still working on it. Um, and then, but the thing is, is, yeah, that would, it would make it not backwards compatible with Swift, which we have not done yet. Mm, I think we can do it backwards. Oh, that's right. He had a password. That's not true. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mike, what do you think about on the, um, the for the proxy layer? You said that the yeah. prototype was looking good for you, but I'm I'm curious. Um, you know, one of the reasons that Go is so attractive at, at the object server layer is you've got that runtime where you can push. You you just do the blocking I/O in a thread. But even the network operations are they are they also in blocking in threads or is everything? Uh, they go into an event loop. So oh, okay, so, so in the proxy, so Go, every Go is a scheduler that uses either real threads or event. An event loop based on very similar to how uh, event loop works. Like if you were to do the the threaded disk IO, uh -huh. it's very similar to that, but it's all baked into the runtime and yeah. it's very fast and very good. Yes. I'm just rushing. There's somebody with a question in the back right there. Huh? I'm blocking it. Oh. <laughs> So back to the container sharding thing. Um, I would think that there are two, two worries that can happen there. One worry is the actual unbalanced ring of the container ring, and the other one is the ability to serve requests or puts to a container that is like really, really huge. Um, what would you define as your primary problem between the two? Would it be the capacity or the ability to work with a large container? Uh, they're both problems. Usually we see more problems with the capacity. Just actually filling up a drive or filling it up enough that we can't do the work we need to, we don't have the scratch space, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, there is. Seems to be a bigger problem than like actually, we don't seem to, have to see a lot of problem, personally, we, I don't see a lot of problems with the replication of those big no. uh, containers or insert speed or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, the two problem, uh, uh, our customers who, who use those big, big containers, they probably never do a container listing. Um, you know, they just, they know it's eventually consistent. And they know that it's, it takes a little while. Uh, the, the problem, the other problem is, is if you get uh, a single drive that has two of these behemoth containers uh, on your SSDs is that SSD will be really full while your normal thing is, it's much lower. Thanks. We're done? Okay, great. Thank you very much.